and I'm supposed to preach after that. <laughs> Whew. Anybody bring an oxygen tent? What a wonderful God we serve. And um, I'm so enjoying this series uh, on the name of the Lord. Let's, let's, let's read. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the streams rose and broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Did you know that when God created everything, did, he created three heavens. Did you know that? There are three heavens. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 2, the apostle Paul mentions that he was caught up to the third heaven. And so what we understand that to mean is that the first heaven is what we call the atmosphere. That's where the birds are and the clouds. The second heaven is what we call the cosmos or the galaxy or space. And the third heaven is where the angels and paradise and where God reigns. Last week I preached to you one of the names of God is El Elyon. Do you remember what that stands for? Well, it's been seven days, I can imagine, okay. God the Most High. God the Most High. That means that he is over everything. That he is above everything. That all things are under God. They are below God. And when I say all things, that means all and everything. Now, I hope you've had some coffee or something to wake you up this morning because I'm going to start off with a mind stretcher, okay? Are you guys ready? This side is, I didn't hear anything from over here. All I saw was Charles go, good for you, brother. Here's a thought. Ready? Since God created these three heavens, and the third one we call heaven is the dwelling place of angels and the location of paradise, then it means beyond the third heaven, God is. Because God created the third heaven. Therefore, he is beyond what we call heaven. He is creator and he, cre and he exists outside of heaven creation. And this place isn't really a, a place that I'm thinking about. It's a realm, if you want to say it that way. Actually, beyond that third heaven is God himself. It's not a place. It's a person. So when it says that God is the most high, absolutely. When it says that he is above and beyond, Absolutely. Have you ever heard of the phrase that God is infinite? That's what I'm preaching about right now. That God has no limits, no boundaries. God is, is unrestricted by space. And guess what? He's also unrestricted by time. Ah. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase that God is eternal? This is this is a statement that lets us know that God exists separate and apart from time. He is non-temporal. Elohim created time, therefore he is not bound by it. Elohim created it, therefore he is not subject 
to its confinement. You and I are what we call linear, meaning that we don't have any choice. We have a beginning point, and we can't choose anything about going further along. We are going to go further along in time, aren't we? Some of you, when you were young, didn't have any wrinkles or gray hair. But you're stuck in that line. That train only goes one way. Do you get, say yes. So we can't do anything. We are linear people. We are temporal people. God is infinite, meaning that he is not. So let's say that this is time, okay? This is the beginning, day one. And this is at the end when God comes back and everything is new, okay? God created this. Therefore, he is outside of it. Listen to me. Your God is exterior of time. Now, when you got stretched a little while ago, that was just to prepare you for this stretch. You ready? That when God predicts that something's going to happen, it doesn't mean that he made it happen. It means that he can see it all at once. That's huge because God is not responsible for so many terrible things that have happened that he says are going to happen. You can jaw on that for a while, see what happens, all right? That's good stuff. So everything that I've stated so far clarifies a point, and the point is, is that God has all supremacy. As we looked at last week, God is preeminent, the Bible says. Elohim, Yahweh is Lord. And so we're going to unpack this morning in this message what it means that God has lordship. And today we're going to focus our first part of our sermon on the word Adonai. Adonai in the Hebrew is plural. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Elohim as a plural word, but it's never translated God's. It's translated singular because God has a plural nature. And so it is with Adonai. We see a plural word. Elohim literally meant the powerful ones. But it's not translated gods because there's only one God. And beside him there is no other. And Adonai is a plural word. And it implies that God has more than a singular nature to him. These are primary Old Testament terms that reinforce the teaching or the doctrine we find of the Trinity, that there is uh, one God made up of three persons, God the, God the, and God the Holy Spirit. Second thing, Adonai was a favored term by rabbis in the old days in the Hebrew uh, Bible and, and, and before Jesus came, the, the rabbis preferred to use the term Adonai, okay? Now, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to show you why the, the rabbis, the scholars, Pharisees, scribes, lawyers, uh, uh, the priests would not want to use Elohim or Yahweh and instead would use Adonai. Here we go. In Exodus chapter 20, uh, God is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that some of you guys have read these before. The first of four of the ten have to do with our relationship with God. One, two, three, four, okay? So let's just review. What is the first commandment, the one that's most important, the one that matters more than the rest of them? Thou shalt have no other God before me, which means I'm it only. I'm the only one. Second commandment, what does it say? Do not fashion... A, 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 uh, something from creation or something from the world and then worship that idol as a god, okay? So we don't, we don't get to create anything that resembles something from creation and then worship it as a god. That's the second one, okay? Now let's look at the third commandment, okay? Here we go. Verse 7. I hope you have your Bibles in this series. I really hope you have them. 
Exodus 20 and verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You know, there's a warning on the end of that, isn't there? Say yes. That's pretty stern, don't you think? If you don't do this one, I'm going to hold you guilty? Why would God do that? Why would he say, do not take my name in vain, and I'm not going to hold you guiltless if you do this? Because it's serious, isn't it? It is. The third commandment was a serious commandment. The rabbis understood this, that under no circumstance was God's name ever to be made common. I mean, much less vulgar. I mean, you guys work in the real world and you go to the real schools and you hear people say God's name and then put a bunch of other words right next to it, don't you? Like (laughs) D-A-M-N. How many times do you hear that a day? All right. And so here's the deal. God says, I do not want you to use my name in a common, vulgar, or as, as if it's just an everyday thing. Because the name of God represents God. It represents his nature and his status. Therefore, the name of God is to be revered. It is sacred. The name of God is sacred. Now, in time, the rabbis, in order not to break this commandment, they didn't use the name Yahweh. They didn't like to use it because it meant that there was a possibility that they were using it in a way that would violate this commandment. So they didn't use Yahweh. Instead, they used Adonai, which is translated in your Bible, L-O-R-D. And so it was the term that they used because they didn't want to break this commandment. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand is that by the time Jesus came, people were never saying Yahweh because they didn't want to break this commandment. Adonai became the favored term in prayers and teaching. Another thing about um, this is that, you know, God says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, hallowed translates to holy. Holy. But that also means that it is to be holified, to kept holy. It is holy, and it needs to be treated holy. So if you don't want to break the third commandment, then when you use the name of God, it is to praise God, to pray to God, to explain God, to teach about God, teach about God's word, right? But you want to avoid saying the name of the Lord in, as an expression or as a surprise, okay? All right. Adonai, the word, expresses the personal relationship between a master and a servant. More than ownership, the word implies a functional relationship, okay? The collaboration doesn't begin with the servant, it begins with the master. The master is responsible for two things. One, to provide for the servant's needs, food, shelter, clothing, Two, to provide direction. The master is responsible for instruction and training and accountability. Therefore, when the word Adonai is used, the responsibility, the greater responsibility, falls upon God more than on his people. Now, a major mistake that Bible readers make is to assume that the master-slave relationships found in Scripture uh, resemble the enslavement of Africans in 19th century United States. Anybody who's read Uncle Tom's Cabin or seen the miniseries Roots witnessed African Americans, black people being abused by their masters. The relationship of slave and master in the Bible was more of one of love and allegiance. In fact, in Israel, check this out, a slave had more privileges than a hired servant because a hired servant was just an employee and a slave was seen as part of the family. And when a man would die, oftentimes he would leave part of his estate to one of his slaves. And so... 
Due to the horrific images of slavery in our modern world, in our recent history, the term master is reviled. And, and, and that's unfortunate because it's a really solid biblical word that has good meaning. But we can't use the word master without getting people distracted by the term itself. But I'm just trying to get you to understand the word Lord means master. That's exactly what it means. And again, if we go to the book of Genesis, go to Genesis 15. We see it's a book of first, right? And then here we see the first time that Adonai is used in Scripture, okay? And it helps us understand a, a bit about its, un, its meaning. Abram has been in Canaan for about 10 years. He's growing restless because earlier God promised him a son that he would have descendants that would fill this land. And here he is. He's getting older and the wife's not getting any younger and they still don't have a kid. And so in, in chapter 15, it says, uh, verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. He reminds him, I made a promise to you, and I'm going to fulfill that. Abram, how does he respond? Verse 2, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So what's he saying? You can't bless me until I have a son. You said you'd give me one, and I still don't have one. But he, he opens that with the first time we ever hear it, this phrase, Lord God, which is Adonai Yahweh. He could have called him God, Elohim. He could have called him El Elyon. That's already been in place, but he didn't. He used the term Adonai. And Adonai was the ancient term of this day for master, Lord. And so what he is saying is, Abram, I'm going to bless you. Lord, I, he has to have God as his Lord, his master in charge. He reminds God that he is in charge. And he saw himself as a servant of God, acknowledging that God had lordship over him. And, and Abraham needs reassuring, right? Sarah needs some reassuring, okay? But he understands that God is Lord. And if God says he's going to do a thing, he's going to do it. And if it takes the Lord a while to get it done, that's his prerogative. Now, we in America don't like that. We don't like somebody giving us a promise and then not delivering it on our time schedule. Well, even Abraham struggled with that, and he had to remind himself, I'm not the one in charge here. Lord, how can you help me? I'm childless. And all the great leaders in the Old Testament revered God as their master. They, held, they knew that God had mastery over them, authority over them. Moses was really troubled when God told him from the burning bush, I want you to go to the most powerful man on the planet and tell him to let all my people go. You know, and do you remember what he said? I got a speech impediment. I, that's what he said. I don't talk good. I don't know how exactly he said that in the Hebrew, but that's what the meaning was. Well, actually, it says in chapter 4 and verse 10 of Exodus, Oh, my Lord. Adonai, I am not eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. So God says, I want you to do this, and he says, I, 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 I. you're picking the wrong guy. Hmm. You, you've never done that, have you? can't use me god i i can't i'm not them i'm just this <laughs> so let me let me ask you family why did moses go to pharaoh with nothing but a rod from god because yahweh is adonai Why did Joshua lead Israel into the conquest of the promised land? Because Adonai is Lord and he was not. Why did Gideon 
take on Midian when he was outnumbered because Adonai is Lord and he was not. And why did Jeremiah continue to preach even though he was mistreated, persecuted, ridiculed, and rejected? And he continued to say what God told him to say, and he never stopped doing that. And as far as we know, not a single person in Israel was converted by his preaching. Fifty years without a convert. I guess we better get that, huh? Why did he preach for 50 years and all he got was kickback and no and rejected? They threw him in a pit. Because Adonai was Lord and he was not. That's why. In the New Testament, one of the most common phrases you're going to find is Jesus is Lord. The New Testament word in Koine Greek for Adonai, which is a Hebrew word, is Kyrios. Kyrios is defined as a master, a ruler, basically the person in charge. Kyrios is the New Testament word for L-O-R-D. Interesting that a majority, uh, majority of the books in the New Testament that use the term Kyrios about Christ are done by Luke and by Paul. And the reason why that stands out is because Luke and Paul were addressing their book uh, to, and their writings to Greeks. And Kyrios is a Greek term that they absolutely, totally knew. The Greeks understood authority and Kyrios was somebody who was in charge. And in time, the church preferred the term Kyrios or Lord over any other term for Christ. After Christ was resurrected and he was exalted by the Father and the Father gave him a name as above every name, the church exalted the name of Christ and they referred to him as Lord. When, when Jesus appeared to Thomas in resurrected form and he told Thomas, put your finger in the hole of my, and put your hand in the slit of my side and stop doubting and believe, what was the confession, what was the profession that the Apostle Thomas said right straight to Jesus' face. My Lord and my God. You see, Lord is the preferred term for Christ in the church age. Here's the proof. In the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as Savior twice. In the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as Lord 95 times. Now, where's the weight? You see, they were already saved by the Savior, right? But who was Jesus to them right then and there? The Lord. Meaning, he's the one who's in charge. He's the one that rules. He's the one who gets his way. And in modern times, it seems like people, even people who are going to houses of worship and they're sitting in church buildings and they're proclaiming faith in God, they just love Jesus as Savior, amen? John 3, 16, love it. Love that cross, love that cross. Why? Because I'm saved by the cross. And I love that Jesus is my Savior. In fact, we make this even more personal when we say, he's my personal Savior. Yeah, you can have your personal Savior, you can have yours, but I have my personal Savior. He died for me. And we love that in America. You know why? Because I get to go to heaven because he died for me. But you know what else Jesus is besides your Savior? He's your Lord, which means that if he says you can do a thing, you can do it. And if he does not give you permission, you cannot do a thing. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Is that not what the scriptures read earlier? That's the, Jesus is Lord. Do you want to know why the church converted the most pagan, brutal empire of its day? Because Jesus is Lord and they were not. And he said, go into all the world and make disciples. Did they go into the world and make disciples? Why? Because Jesus said right before that, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. He pulled rank and told them what to do. You know, that's what happens to some of you people who work in management, right? 
You walk into your department and you have to remind them what your title is and how long you've been there and who you work, and, and then you have to tell them what to do. Because if you just go in there and tell them what to do, they're like, mmm, mmm, mmm. And so he goes, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. That's the commandment. Go. While you're going, make disciples. What do you do with disciples? People that want to be a disciple, what do you do with them? You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you what? Teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And did the early church do that? Yes, it did. Does the Church of Christ on 801 North Tully do that? We're working at it. Anybody disagree? I mean, there's some in us that are doing that. There are some in this congregation that are doing that. So we are, as a congregation, doing that. Were those commandments made just to leaders? Figure it out. The early church didn't think so, because everybody got busy doing that. Not only did they teach them the gospel and baptize them, then they taught them how to stay with it and do what God says because Jesus is Lord. Amen? What is Jesus Lord over? Well, in Romans 14, he's the ruler of the dead and the living, which means he's ruler over mankind. In Revelation 1, 5, he is ruler over all the kings of the earth. Christ is over all human and spiritual authority. Do you see that in Ephesians 1, 21? And then in Colossians 1, 18, last week we saw that he is Lord over the church, which means that every doctrine taught must be in compliance with Jesus Every practice performed in a congregation must be in compliance with the Lord and his teaching. We don't have permission to ignore parts that we don't like anymore. We don't have the option of opting out of some of the hard teachings in the New Testament that go against our cultural norms. We also don't have the option to add to God's will, written word, what we want it to say or we want to hold over other people. We don't have that either. You know why? Because Jesus is Lord and we are not. There is not a group of people on planet Earth that have the authority to take away or add to this Bible. Amen. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. When he came here, he said, I didn't come here to judge the earth. I came here to save it. But there is a judge. The very words which I have spoke will judge a person on that day. So we don't get to change that. Because he is Lord. And... We are not. There's, there's really only one place in the universe where Jesus does not rule as Lord. There's one place where he is not master, where he's not in charge. And, and that's the human heart. Especially American hearts. We resist authority. We resist anybody telling us what to do. And the only way that Jesus is your Lord is because you have chosen him, him to be the Lord of your life. You've made that decision. The only way that Jesus is your Lord is because you have surrendered your will to his and you have submitted yourself to him. And the only way that Jesus can be your Lord is that you have confessed him to be the Lord, right? What does it say? God's purpose, ultimate purpose for mankind is that every knee shall bow to him and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That doesn't mean just at the end of time. That means today, friend, today. Is Jesus Lord of your life? 
Only you know that. Is he Lord of your life automatically? Nope. You have to make your decision. And every single one of us has to decide who in my life is on the throne. Who's in charge? Who is first above everything and everyone else? The only way that Jesus will remain your Lord is if you obey his will and continue to. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? There are consequences for calling Jesus Lord but ignoring his demands. There is also a rich reward for surrendering your life to the Lordship of Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a reward, isn't it? Is that a one-time confession? Thank you. That's a lifestyle confession, isn't it? Is Jesus Lord? The Bible says so. Is Jesus your Lord? I hope so. I really hope so. Because if you do not do that, everything else in your life doesn't matter. Whatever you are and whatever you've done, whatever your peers think of you and whatever you're proud of in yourself, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life and confessed him as such, what does it profit to gain the whole world and to lose your soul? Well, how do I save my soul? Well, first of all, you have to admit, you don't. <laughs> you can't. Jesus can, right? And you know what he says? This whole message says one thing. Uh, I'm going to kind of need you to get out of my way. I'm going to need you to stop being resistant. I'm going to need you to stop being sinful. I need you to just stop being in control of your life and let me be Lord. Because the very best thing that we could ever do is have Jesus as Lord. Make sense? All right, Joe, let's stand up. Let's sing. Something on your heart? Oh, I hope there is. If there is, let us know. Come on up and let us know as we sing.